off uh, the recording. All right, welcome um, to my tutorial from dozens of evidence to thousands and uh, for important lessons when scaling up um, structural MRI processing and this time using CAT. It's part um, of, uh, the, of the educational, which uh, deals with methods for analyzing large neuroimaging data sets. And um, I will look at structural MRI processing first uh, a little with the computation and anatomy toolbox and make clear why we need large scale um, processing and, and we'll do an introduction into a workflow with data lab we recently um, devised. Now, so first a few acknowledgements. Um, Christian Gaza developed the other main developers of, of the computation and anatomy toolbox, which I will use here. Then um, I will heavily, everything relies on data lab, which is um, developed by Michael Hanke and Jaroslav Filchenko, main, but there are a lot of people that actually are working actively on that and it's a really powerful tool. And then the last one is the fairly big um, framework for computational reproducible processing of large scale data we just published. And here you see first that there's a poster exactly presented here at HBM for of this work. And if you click on these, these two things here, you will directly go to the poster and to the paper in the internet. And, the, and you will find as well um, the, every slides with clickable links and um, things later if we look um, in the Foursquare app there. Now, the plan for the whole thing is first, I will talk briefly about voxel-based morphometry. Then I will talk about the computational anatomy toolbox and what it can do. Then uh, the question, why should we do large scale neuroscience at all? Then I will talk about reproducible data processing. And then uh, we'll talk about what's data led anyway, if you didn't know before. Now, um, the main part will be the fairly big workflow where we talk about the boot, bootstrap of the workflow, then the execution and the consolidation of results to be used afterwards. And uh, later we'll do, uh, talk briefly about important lessons of large scale um, neuroscience. So what you find as well is the bootstrapping uh, the fairly big workflow. Um, you should do that yourself. Basically, the, that what you can do is you, if you install data, let's set it up and then get an open size framework account for publishing the data and data let extension, you can execute, execute um, the, the code you see in black here, which you can copy uh, from the slides. Um, if you install the thing and ex execute this on, your, on the Linux computer, everything on your Linux um, will, so the whole workflow will set it up uh, itself. You will compute three subjects and then have basically some results later um, in your data set that you can then yourself publish on an open size um, framework. So that's, it's an example for how doing really large scale neuroscience with this framework. The same works with Mac, but there's a slight thing you have to do yourself is downloading because um, CAT is based on, on a MATLAB, downloading the MATLAB computational runtime and installing it yourself because Mac is not as easily scriptable. On Windows, there's, um, there's, it's not, the, the workflow doesn't work directly out of the box. And in the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, you can install this, um, boots, you can bootstrap the workflow, but MATLAB computation runtime won't work that much. And I would recommend to, to stay on Mac or Linux for that. Now, let's talk about um, voxel-based morphometry. Before, on 19, 1999, there came deform, there were deformation-based morphology was devised. And that was basically a method for um, doing um, vo brain-wide analysis of structure in an automatic way, which was not the case before. And here, Christian Gaber did on 85 schizophrenic patients and 75 healthy subjects, so 160 subjects for the first study already. And the core idea here is we have a template and we have a lot of single subject brains. The single subject brains, if we uh, normalize them non-linearly to the template, we are ending up with 3D deformation fields, which are on the template space. And then we can do statistics on these deformation fields, even um, for every voxel. And this is the core idea where we then can devise volume change, regional volume spaces over the group of volume changes, like where there's more or less volume, um, and what you see here are actually 
less volume in uh, patients with schizophrenia in the basal ganglia, for example, and cerebellum. And if you didn't see the glass brain here on the right, it's actually a very honest view on the brain because you see quite a lot more regions with a significant effect than on the um, renderings on the left you're accustomed to. Now, a few two years later, there came the first official voxel-based morphometry study on 465 normal adults from London, uh, done with SPM. And um, there, what they did, uh, the core is that they did modulation. What's modulation? There, um, the result of the nonlinear spatial normalization, the volumes of certain brain regions may grow or may shrink when you do an information from single subject to the template. And now, if you use this, so doing a multiplication of the voxel values um, of the voxel values and of the gray matter with the Jacobian determinants, so how much you changed it to the template, you get something like a regional um, measure of, of absolute volume. And this is the VBM. If you do that with unmutilated data, then you would see it's a regional difference in concentration of gray matter. And that's the general difference. There are arguments for one or the other, but I think the classical voxel-based morphometry that we now use for 20 years is really the modulation of gray matter. What they find is here you see on, on the left is age on the axis to regression with the gray matter volume is that we have really steep decline of gray matter of the brain, which is the aging effect we know. And um, on the right, and it's, there's quite a difference between men and women, with men um, uh, have a larger volume, but it seems even a larger decrease in general. But if we do a gray matter, fraction of total uh, total intracranial volume, the difference is less, but there's still quite an atrophy. And there were some follow-up studies really showing that this, at this atrophy we supposed to measure here with MRI is actually there um, post-mortem and in, in physiology, physiology, which is quite, quite a good thing for a non-invasive measure, right? So these are, and these are the voxel wise, voxel wise um, the first voxel wise um, results of statistical atrophy in here the anterior single cortex and and the insula, and uh, this can and even the first study doing this used 465 um, uh, subjects for doing this, and this is I think very important to see. You shouldn't go uh, lower than this than than write hundreds of subjects. Now, um, CUTS basically is the successor of the VBM toolbox for SPM, and uh, now there's actually, it's based on MATLAB and SPM, and there's an Enigma toolbox where you can download a standalone version, which is scriptable, and doing it in the Enigma way to only share derivatives of the data. What you feed it is you get tissue segments and label images, and as well, you do surface-based uh, projection and surface analysis. And uh, as I said, the scripting capabilities are quite good, which we need really for large-scale neuroscience but the GUI as well is quite cool. Anyway, what you in general have is you use tissue probability maps to do segmentation. You do can do VBM, you can do RBM region-based morphometry, like region by regional um, analysis of volume. And you, as well, you do a surface uh, projection with where you have surface templates, including um, the free surfer, the FS average of free surfer. And you actually can use um, cuts and to analyze free surfer results uh, and do QC on that. Uh, so it's, it's interoper interoperable. And the same, you can do regional um, analysis with surface atlases as well. Now, why do large scale analysis? And um, Charzat, with Charzat, we did an, a, an analysis of the uh, replicability of association of brain structure and behavior. And what we find is first, let's look at H, what we found before, the replicability with 300 subjects is quite good. So the yellow and blue areas are significant of 100 um, as bootstrap analysis. These are replicable results all over the brain. So with H, the atrophy is quite replicable, that's good. But if we then go down to 200 subjects, the so rep replicability drops to 50%. And if we are with a few more than 100 subjects, only very few regions are actually replicably um, reproducibly fine in our analysis. That doesn't sound really good, but it gets worse. But it, because with um, a body mass index, which is another physiologically physiological measure, which we know have an association with the brain, 
already with 300, replicability is not very good. The point that I'm gonna want to make here is we really need to go um, for have high numbers for structural brain analysis to be replicable. And even if you find something statistically significant and everything you see here is in blue, at least in one analysis, you really have to go quite a step further to, to generalize your results and to say that you are reproducible. And this is actually done on the enhanced AKI dataset. Okay, what is then the large scale data uh, analysis? Um, first, I would say when you shouldn't look at all the data sets and this is so at least 200 and more, of course you can look at them, but we will make errors and you will look at them a few times. So that's, that's the first thing. Second, when data processing on a machine takes weeks. So if it takes quite a long time, then it's a large scale analysis. When you frequent reprocessing is not an option because it takes weeks, it's a large scale analysis. Then when data is growing over time, so you have to add subjects or redo the whole thing, it's a large scale analysis. And when you're not the only data consumer, so everyone, someone else is actually using the data, it's large scale analysis. And um, you want to do something similar, which basically, if you know something, you will apply it, it's large scale. And when you actually want to share data and results, it's large scale, you should work with the large scale analysis. And so the main thing here is treat every analysis as a large scale analysis. So what does that mean? Now let's look at data processing. Classically, what we have is a mountain of mountain of data on one hand, on one side in a certain structure, we know that. So, and, and this, we have a pipeline we want to use with this, uh, with this mountain of data. Now we write our code, we test it, we devise it, we have it, and it fits perfectly to the data and the pipeline and reproduce mountains of results. That's very good. That's um, how everybody works, how I work basically. And um, there are a few problems with this as that we will see. But first we publish it, so it's good. So it's nothing wrong here. But now what can be is then later the data will be archived because it's way too big to just having it lying around on the computer we work with, or we just leave, let's say. So, and some that say, okay, we can download at any time. So let's just erase it here. So it's not easy to retrieve. Second, the results are, are quite big as well. So we archived it as we have to, but to retrieve them, yeah, it will take time. Then, oh damn, the pipeline, yeah, um, we, I have it, but it doesn't work anymore on, on the servers we have or on my computer because I just did an update. No problem, we can check that. And for the code, yeah, I have the script somewhere, give me a minute. So I think that's for after a paper published is most of the time, this is the state of affairs that we're dealing with, I dealt with. And that's the question, how can we overcome this? Now, reproducible data processing should be done as, or can be done with a few things uh, easily a little different. So first thing, data structure is very important and BITS is a brain imaging data structure that is very, very helpful because it's not only gives us a naming scheme and a structure how to, how to to structure data and uh, thereby it fits, but as well that it comes with uh, files that we know exactly how the data was acquired and so on and so forth. Now the result to how to, pro to um, report results in any paper and even better for yourself for to give, uh, to talk about there's the best practices in data analysis was, which was actually in OHBM um, um, initiative where, where there's a scheme of what kind of um, how data was acquired, how the analysis was done, what kind of information you need to actually make um, an analysis result to understand results and to make analysis reproducible. And if you didn't know that, look that, and um, there's, there are ways to, to uh, help that you can document this. And there are now large scale initiatives like Zenodo or Open Science uh, uh, Framework, how to share data and you don't pay for it and you can make data publicly available and even smaller data parts you can share with, with um, your colleagues um, without making them totally public. But to putting it somewhere where it will stay for a longer time is key here. Now for pipelines, I would strongly recommend containerization. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but the main thing here is if you if your container runs on your system, you can freeze the whole analysis setup all the software and can reuse it. And you don't have to install everything, but you have it basically to take with you. 
Docker is one solution, but I would recommend Singularity because you can use it on high performance computing. It has less uh, security issues. And with code, as everybody that knows it already uses it, it's um, a provenance tracking and tracking of your code with Git. It's very powerful. I only started a few years ago and I can strongly recommend to do that. And, um, and then you can share your code either on GitHub, the commercial thing, or a GitLab, which are open source things, uh, open, open source repositories where you can put your code openly or not openly. And um, what I can, I can only reiterate, if you are programming in any way, most of your um, editors have a built-in Git capability and you are actually only two to three clicks away from using Git for your code and thereby avoiding having 20 versions of the same of the same script in one folder with different names. I have tons of them, but really a, um, a tracked development of your code there. Now, this is all looks all colorful. You didn't hear this, this talk the first time and then the rest. So the thing is, you just go learning all this, come back in a year, and then you go do good reproducible data, data processing. But that's not the point here learning one by one thing after the other. Git is the key, I would say, but um, actually you can do, you can use data lab for that. For a lot of things, data lab will automatize for you and help you with this. How? So what is data lab anyway? So data lab is, um, can help you with small or large scale data management. So for really huge data or really small data, it's free open source. You need a command line, but actually your Python API, um, if, you use, if you use Python, but you actually own on the low, lower end, you need like five commands to really use it and um, take the benefits with it. What can it do is that it works on a lot of different platforms. It builds on Git and on Git Annex and allows for version controlling arbitrary large content. So as well, your huge data, input data you have there, your containers and pipelines, your code, of course, and as well the results and you have a transport mechanism for sharing or paying data. So the upload to Open Science Framework or Zenodo or Jin will really only take two commands or some of this, and that's, that's really nice. And what I will talk about is the computational reproducible data analysis is possible more or less automatically with DataLab. Now, let's see how that actually works. We do data lab processing, which um, um, builds heavily on Git to tracking changes of any files we have in our project. And, but it comes additionally with Git Annex and Git Annex has the capabilities of um, tracking big files and making them available from far automatically. So you don't have to store everything on your one computer or on the server that's beside your computer or on your hard disk to have access to all your data and to the results afterwards. So it makes it a lot easier to handle. Now for data lab, everything is a data set. And that's the point that, so let's think about data sets. First, the data is a data set. And if you see this gray things is you don't need all the data really locally or computer, but with, um, with data lab and Git Annex, you can see everything that's there, but you don't have to have all your data on your computer, but you have access to it. Now the results is the, is the one that we are interested in because that's what we want to build, a data set with the results. The code we naturally, we put into our results data set because afterwards we want to see how the results are, um, are all, let's say computed. And the pipeline could be a containerized pipeline data set. These are all different data sets that we can manage with, with data labs. And with data labs, the cool thing is you can clone everything everywhere without data content. And the easiest thing is just clone the whole HCP data set with one command, look at all the files on your laptop, regardless of how big it is. And then if you do it the first time, it's quite cool to see that. Now, let's do the tutorial. Either you already um, um, executed the, the, the lines that I gave you at the beginning, but uh, what you actually do there is we, um, we use the uh, Aomic uh, POP2 data set from, from Open Euro for this tutorial. And um, we do, one thing is we do quick and dirty processing. So don't use the data. I shrink the data that's very quick, but if you want to use the data, you have to change a few things. Okay, which is for Now, the pipeline data set, what we do is, uh, yeah, we can't share the cat container. So we devised a um, singularity 
recipe to build your container by your own and the, here are the instructions. But for now, um, for, for the tutorial, um, I built, we will use the CUT standalone version and the MATLAB compiler runtime and, and just do it. So you either did it already. So let's now understand what you did there or you can do it afterwards. So on the OMIC, we will look at the if you have two data set, which has 200, and 200, uh, 200 almost 200 uh, structural images, which is at the border, let's say, of, of uh, large scale neuroscience. So I would say use the P of two and P of one as well for replication. And you down here is a link to it. And there's a lot of more data that you can use with data as well. Now let's look at some code. Okay, so what you executed at the beginning of your bootstrap script is that you define a few things, right? So first, what's, what's the name of the project? What's the name of the sample? And, uh, and this will be used later to find your things. But now we have a few inputs and output stores. Okay, so an input store, output store, and a raw store. Raw store, you see me see get that's the raw store is the raw data, and you see there we have the GitHub Open Your Data Set. Um, we can actually clone to our data set and thereby have accessible. Now, why have we an input and output store? The the interesting thing here is that later we will clone the the an empty workflow to do processing. And the output store, that will we only collect um, the, the computed results for each and every job in this kind of subject. So there's, there's a difference we make here. Lastly, there's a temporal store. So um, this, is, this is as well important. We, the computation we can actually do anywhere there where this has any computational machine, right? We can send it and it can be computed wherever you like. But the output then is collected together in the output store. And you define them all here. They're defined in your working directory when you started it. And the container store, we don't have it here, but um, as we use container, but that would be the, the device thing that we have an additional um, container data set attached there. And one thing just uh, to say here is we have a nested structure um, of data sets that we don't carry all data sets at once with us. Next thing is what we do is we data let create uh, a, the, the, our data set, which is basically we have then our results data set. So only look at the top. Yeah, sorry. And we use the Yoda principles. What is that? Yoda principles is that we have a certain structure of our results. We have a code. We have some. We define that the Git stuff is not um, is not touched by Git Annex, so that it all went went smoothly. Main thing is in the code folder, not all the data will will be all the scripts will be tracked by Git, and thereby we have really a history of all changes we do to our code, or in this, in this case, to our pipeline as well. Then in the uh, lower half of the screen here, um, we will get the standalone version and copy its register to our results data, to our results data set. And first, and, and the, the, the important thing is see the data that run command, which is the third line below, where we basically say what we want to do. We want to download the standalone version that we defined before from the internet. And then we get it, we unzip it, and we remove the zip. And then we will we have the standalone version, which is well the Enigma cut version, in our results data set and saved. Right? So it is part there. And if we look at the results later, all the, the pipeline will be part of it. And we can actually exactly see what we do, uh, what we did and what we want. Now, um, next, what we will do is we data let clone the, the input data as a, and we put it in there as an additional data set. The minus D uh, and the dot says that we're doing a, we attaching a sub data set to our results data set. And in this case, it's the LMAQ op data set. And the, the important thing here is that we don't have all the data around all the time, but we attach it as a, as a sub data set with a link to the data which is in the internet that for any given time we can data let get the data we need and the git commits it's always good to have tracked that afterwards to see what you did right now what we're doing now is we need uh, we creating git siblings which is basically the idea that we to to define the input and output stores and what we will um, first do is to create sibling ria um, command to have the input store and an output store and defines which is a link to somewhere else where we can at any point given time we can clone the whole thing from and we can push results to. 
Now, the last thing we actually need is a uh, compute job specification, and I won't go, uh, won't uh, discuss it here, but the, it's in the bootstrap script. Um, there is the setup of the participant job, so of every computation for every job is in there, and we can change it there, and later it's automatically created as the participant job, which is executed for any job and any, any uh, T1 image later. And here we use cut for the, for the computation. Then the second, the, the next thing we need is in uh, is is in setup of the actual compute process. So, uh, set up how this compute job is executed um, on on any uh, temporal node or somewhere else. And here we give some environmental variables and some labeling and the rest. And then and do a, uh, and really below you see there's we do a lock um, lock here and the rest to see really what we did. And um, what is important here is that we we uh, have different files for the job execution for having the environment set up and for um, for setting up as well um, some if if we want to use a scheduler as well so the we can automatically set up the schedule for high, high throughput computing or for slurm for different schedulers which we can set up in the bootstrap script that we can directly execute the whole workflow for all subjects and um, yeah, the point I want to make here is that we want to devise it all um, that it's relative, that that it's that we don't have any full path in here, that we have it all relative to where we execute the whole workflow, that it will work in, on any machine anywhere that actually can run the scripts. Okay, now um, if we execute this, what will actually happen? Now. Um, Afterwards, this is what you see in, in the folder when you, when you just look at it. And there we have basically, um, in the code folder, we have all the scripts that we need. And um, then we have the inputs data set, which actually is a separate data set that we can get, get the data at any time from. We have the in setup of a Condor um, workflow here. And um, from here, we can execute, we can just say submit jobs um, to a scheduler or to, let's say to be executed in the background. Now, how that works is uh, specifically is from an input store for every job, the results, the whole data set is, is cloned um, and it's a temporal clone. And then it's getting the data and then the whole thing is executed. And then the, the results are pushed to an output store and then everything is thrown away. This this whole is this so so this setup is done for each and every job and only if we succeed is we have anything in the output store so any halfway job will not have written anything so we don't have traces of half half uh, run data and the rest and we, we and everything is tracked by Git and so forth so that is that is very handy and can be executed anywhere and the idea really to to uh, have different stores and why now you see why we have the input store because we're cloning a an empty data set from the input store, if we would clone from the same store, the output store where we push the data to, any clone afterwards will be slower because there's already data. And that's why we separate out this these empty clone of the data set which we use for processing and then pushing results and in the output store. And from both we can, and from the output store, when we can clone the results. Now, let's say that what we do to consolidate uh, the every results we have, and one thing to, to just to mention is every, um, every subject or every job we compute, we compute it in an own Git branch, which means that we, uh, that's at the end, we have to combine these branches um, into, into a data set. So how we do that, we first um, clone the results, the, the ready data set with a lot of branches for all the jobs from the output store. And uh, we have there this results.merge script, which will do it for you, which consists first in the octopus git merge, uh, which will just merge all these single jobs together in, in, in our big data set. Then we get in, do in git annex file check, which in the end says, so are all these files that computed actually there and findable by, by git annex in, in the data, data set? Then we say, Git annex dead here, which seems okay. When we do the consolidation here, we don't want to data lab to remember that here is some data. I'm just saying this because data lab in the background remembers everything, right? 
And then in the end, we push back only um, the metadata because we the only thing we want in the output store to give back is saying, yeah, the data is like all put it all together and the data is reachable and thereby we consolidate our of our um, data set that when then we can we can clone at any time from that store. Okay, so um, what what I did the processing for the uh, Aomic job uh, one and and two for you and can you can clone the whole data sets from this with with these one uh, two lines up here, and if you then open the data sets, they will look exactly like what you just saw here with the results. No, not exactly because I did I used the cut uh, containerized version, and um, but you have an access to um, the the uh, raw data. You can you see the, the, the see the pipe the, the pipeline, but you can't get it because I can't share it on the Open Science Framework. And um, the few lines you see on the Bootstrap script uh, is uh, on on the slide is that you can push recreate such a data set yourself. Now this fairly big workflow is very powerful, and I just recommend you can use it with any kind of container. And one one way to go is for a repronym uh, container repository where there's a lot of container you can just at, uh, clone as a sub data set to your results data set and then can do your computation with exactly the setup and if you are if you're thinking i need some data go to datasets.datalab.org there's a lot of data like everything you know is there and a lot more and you can with basically with uh, with only one line you have this data available with data lab So we have, um, let's say some, some five, six minutes. So I would like to do, is it scalable? That will be the question that sounds really nice and that's all good, but does it actually work? Yes, it did. We published it. And uh, what we did is we did it um, on, uh, we tried, so the, what we're trying to accomplish is, is fairness. Now, what does it mean? Um, it's, uh, you heard it as well, but it's the important thing here is that you actually find the data afterwards. So findable that it's accessible so that you can actually um, do something with it. And uh, no, that you can actually see uh, what it is, basically. It's interoperable, so you can use it on any platform, the data, and it's not only working on this one computer or this one program, and it's reusable that you can actually use it afterwards. This is more a conceptual, let's say, thing to, to, to reach, and it's difficult, but data that helps with that. And, um, we tried to we did it with uh, tried to do it with the biobank um, with a lot of with 42,000 participants with 76 terabyte of data and a lot of files and there we had a few other problems or we we tried to solve and which is basically we um, different we use different infrastructure to for doing the same thing so first a high performance computing system which has uh, other um, data data uh, limitations to handle data and a high throughput computation system or local cluster which where you can just can't store that much data at the time, same time then we have in classically the medical data um, a restriction so you shouldn't or it's good that you can't access all data of everybody with, uh, everywhere i'm very convinced of that the good thing is that data lab makes it possible to control access inherently. So it's not only like, okay, you can share everything and it's nice for everybody, but everybody, but only if you have access, you can see data through data led, but you can only access data if you have actually um, the, 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 uh, the permission to access data and data led handles that very, very well. Lastly, it can, as shown before, it can as well handle like MATLAB, like really license-based software. So it's not limited to free and open software, which um, is of, of course a, um, a good way to go um, if, there's, if it's a good alternative. Now, um, let me show you a brief video of how that, how, uh, how basically the, if it would work. Yes. So what we did here is that what you see here is the Git history of the whole setup that we just created on the large scale with the UK Biobank. And uh, with Datalad and exactly the setup, we captured everything that is done. And this is uh, done with Gors, a visual history 
of all the Git commits. So first, this setup as you did was, was built. And in green, you see the first um, compute jobs that are computed. And here you see there are a lot of parallel computing going on. And the green ones that stick a little more out are the second scans of all the UK Biobank subjects. So that's a nice feature of the way how to visualize this. We have a timestamp of every computation and every job here was given one um, CPU hour, four gigabytes of RAM and some disk space and created the identical output, similar outputs, output files we put to the output store. On our compute cluster, we can only, only run 600 subjects uh, or jobs at the same time. And thereby, it in the end took quite six weeks to compute all the good 40,000 subjects. But everything, is all, uh, everything was identically processed with this setup you just saw there. Now we did the same on the high performance, high performance computing system, Eureka. And there, it's exactly identical what we did and it took 10 hours to compute all 40,000 subjects. And what I wanna stress here is that you see in paper that there we had as well for the VVM part, there was bit identical results we could obtain, which is not the case for surface-based analysis, by the way, and uh, for some others. Now, this, this is, uh, I hope I convinced you that this works. And, um, but now I wanna come back to some, um, some personal experience. So important lessons I learned doing um, our scale um, analysis. So for, first, for any code, I would really recommend to use Git, which I don't do long, but it's really making a lot of things easier. And even for the small things, like the small script I wrote here and there to do this and that, if you don't do this, you don't have access to the data anymore. So use Git, put it somewhere. And Git doesn't mean you share everything. You can do it privately for yourself because that's the other thing. Do I want to share all my code? No, I won't because it's not good. But to have the first, to have a track and second that you can share it structured, it's very, very helpful. And Datalad actually takes care of this as well. You can do, you can even track all your code with Datalad. Easier, I would say. Now for the data, um, the same thing, use bits everywhere, um, everywhere and for any data set. Um, I cannot stress this enough. Sometimes you can't really do full bits, basically create all the, um, if have all information, how data was acquired and the rest, but then use the bits naming scheme and the structure how the data is stored. Because if you don't do it and want to do any further, ana further um, analysis with the data or do reanalysis or use another tool, it won't work. You have to recode something. And this always takes a lot of time. So um, I can't really remember any time where not using bits saves time for me. So really do that. And it's not only available for MRI data, but now for ME, M, uh, EEG, M, MEG, physiological data, and uh, for, I think for, for a lot of other things as well. So it's, it's really powerful. And actually this is really exceptional, I think for any um, applied data, data science field that there is a, more or less regreed on standard. Now, processing issues. You process like 10% of the data and you find some, something crashes or there's something glitched there. Okay, let's find the error and now let's look at it. And but my, my, what I really recommend is redo everything, right? If you didn't do like 90% and there's only a few miss, missing, always redo everything. Because finding, finding the bug is one thing but tracing back what was where, sorting out what data actually is good, what not, will most of the time take more time. Of course, with UK Biobank, we do, won't do that. But for anything, we talk about 200 subjects. If you have a, if your data, if you didn't do everything and you have two subjects that missing, redo the whole thing because it's in the end will save time. And um, last thing regarding results, not the last thing, but um, it's, do QC because you have to, Q, to have to do quality control. How did your processing actually works? And I would say try to uh, not try script quality control always. Even if you look at a few things um, manually, script how you get there. So script everything that you can redo it and you can show it to other. And one thing I would say for the thumb is look only maximum at five percent of the data. I know that for a few tools and for other things you should look at everything, but um, I personally 
don't think that you will find everything if you look at everything. You will miss something, so script it and do it multiple times for those that your scripts say are bad, right? Okay, now to the statistics. Um, I promise to talk about statistics. I don't really want to do that here. The main thing about statistics here is for any statistics you do, redo quality control. Because even if, you, if you're told, yeah, the data is good, a lot of people looked at it, it might really depend on your methods, statistical methods you use, how, um, how quality control you have to do, how important outlier ex um, exclusion is, how important um, normalization is, that you can argue is, is a step of the analysis. But I think quality control is, should be part of any statistical analysis, and that should fit your method. And um, the, last, the last thing, so statistics in principle, you need more RAM and you need bigger models to be careful with p-values because bigger they are, they get small fast, so effect size is the thing, and again, reproducibility. So last thing I wanna say, I want you to control data with data led. The data led handbook is very, very good. So you can either go, go to it um, uh, in between or uh, just, just read it from, from beginning to end. And point to, to Adina and the others that are writing it, if there's something not, not, not uh, something to add, they would be very happy about this. There's actually a data led YouTube channel where you can learn a lot about data led. And there's, it's interoperable with um, a lot of um, tools you have on the internet. So it's, it's really a general solution that it's quite easy to use if you want. And with this, I'm happy to, to, uh, to read any questions. Um, that you sent me and then have a good day.